So we're at Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, we've been observing this transition that takes place by the power of God that is already at work in you. Let me just read it here in, in chapter 2, verse 1. And you, he made alive. In, in King James, quickened, you know. Who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as everybody else is, right? But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. We see this transition from hopelessness to glory, from, from death to life, from slavery to sin and to this world's conditions to a son of God, to a child of the king. From going from a place where there's no hope to a place where there's glorious hope. We were dead. We were dead. We could do nothing about that. But God, I love that. But now he has made us alive through his mighty power. Through this amazing grace that has been brought to us, delivered to us. And so as you, as you look at this, you actually see two kingdoms. You see Satan, his kingdom, his realm prince of the power of the air around this world and yet you see God's kingdom this describes Christianity Christianity isn't choosing to believe certain things Christianity isn't joining a church or membership or or you know doing good works Christianity is having life given to you. <laughs> it's something God has done to you. It's where he's brought you to. It's how he's awakened you. It's how he's given you life and breathed that life into you. And notice through this whole passage here, he is describing this brand new union with Christ. We're going to discover that more today. We're going to discover it's, it's together with him and together with him and together with him. We're going through these things. The, and one of the things in this passage we need to kind of understand is he's not talking about something that's going to happen. He is talking about something that has already happened. He... He says it interestingly, you know, this has happened. Yes, it may take us time to appreciate that and appropriate that into our lives. But understand that when you come from death to life, when you're born, life happens immediately. It's boom. It's on. It, it isn't a slow process. It happens, you know. And, and it just takes us a while to move into that, to understand that, to, to get through that. So many times we think of ourselves as Christians only in proportion to how we're, we're walking it out. <sighs> still playing with that sin. I've still got this issue over here. I'm still not good at that, you know. And we, we say, well, I'm just this kind of Christian. Well, would you get that out of your mind? Would you understand that Christ has made you this kind of a Christian? And now it's our job to move into that kind of a Christian, not this kind of a Christian. 
What makes us a Christian isn't what we're doing. It's what he has done to us and for us. It's, it's the power, it's that wonderful, marvelous, amazing power of God that is already at work in the Christian, in the believer. And some people, they'll read through a passage like this and you know, it, it tells us some marvelous things. And they'll go, well, you know, that's, that's kind of true, but we really haven't moved into that yet. You know, one day we're gonna arrive at this place. One day we're gonna be that way. But the Apostle Paul is telling you, no, 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 it's not one day. You are there right now. You are this right now. I know maybe you don't believe that, but you are that. I don't care if you believe it or not. He, pray, he prays for us. Oh, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. That you might know the exceeding greatness of the power that is already at work at you. And so many times, that's exactly what we need. We need to really understand, God has done all of this stuff and we're playing over here in the mud pile. No, no, no. Get out of that. Get to where God has you. It's not future. It's right now. And when you understand a passage like this, it will remove all that fear of death, all that fear of what's coming away from you. And I, I don't need to fear that because I'm already in heaven. I'm already seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You know, there's this saying out there, and I, I love it ever since I read it the first time. Those saints of old who have passed away, David, you know, Daniel, John and Peter, they are more happy in heaven, but they are not more saved than I am or than you are. Oh, no, no. We are just as secure as they ever were. And I love that. Notice Ephesians 2, 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, because of our trespasses, because of our sins, we are spiritually dead. He made us alive together with Christ. Notice that connection. It's a vital connection. You're going to read it over and over here. You know, it's with him, for by grace you have been saved. Do you see the tenses in that? The way it's said, it says, by grace you have been. And literally, you, you can put once and for all. It's in the errorist tense in the Greek, which means it's a one time, but it's a forever deal. And it's purely objective. It has nothing to do with you feeling it, you understanding it. No, it's done. It's a done deal. What has happened to us spiritually can now be compared with what happened to our Lord physically. And he's going to walk us through some of that ground. Christ had died, right? He went to that cross. He died on that cross. They put him in that grave. And then he was quickened and rose to new life. Oh, that same thing is happening to you spiritually, has happened to the believer spiritually. He appeared before certain people as a witness to them. And then he ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty. And that same power is now at work in you doing those exact same things. We are now seated with Christ in heavenly places. We are now arisen from the death. You know, we were all crucified with Christ. My old man was crucified with Christ. He was buried, but then he rose again. And now I have that new life. 
Paul doesn't say God is going to do this. Paul says he has done this once and for all. It's completed. It's completed. You're not completed. It's completed. <laughs> we have been given life. We have been raised from the dead. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So the Christian is, as he points out in this passage, the exact opposite of what those three verses, first three verses, two, one, two, and three, tell us about the one who isn't a believer. They are dead in trespasses and sins. They're being led about by the course of this world, by Satan's plan and his will. They're being dominated by the desires and the lusts of the flesh and of the mind and are by nature children of wrath. But we've been quickened. We've been given life. We're alive. We're raised. We're seated with Christ. Do you see the contrast? Do you see the amazing contrast? So many times we have the wrong impression of ourselves. Oh, I'm just an idiot, you know. I just, uh, there's no difference between me and that guy over there. There's a ton of difference between you and that guy over there. The apostle is masterfully showing us what we once were and what we are now. And we need to get a hold of what we are now. And notice how this has happened in, in verses 5 through 7. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, he made, us to, to, he made us alive, notice this, together with Christ, and raised us up together with Christ, and made us sit together with Christ. Are you getting a picture here? Together with, together with, together with. <laughs> there's this union that happens you can study it in Romans chapter 6 and chapter 7 you can see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 you can hear Paul make this blatant statement in Galatians 2.20 for I have been crucified with Christ and I it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me and then he, he catches himself and he goes, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This isn't the end of Christianity. That is the beginning. That is the starting line of Christianity. This is where we start. And there's two ways that we are united with Christ. One is a legal way. One is a covenant. One is you know, kind of a federal way. We were once all in Adam. He was our champion. He was our first. We're all his progeny. You know, we're all his kids in some way or another. And because he failed and sinned, his sin is passed on to all of his bloodline. That's us. Whatever happened in Adam happened in us. But now, but now we have been born again in Christ Jesus. And now, whatever happened to Jesus Christ our Lord happens to us. Because we did it? No, because we're his downline. Because it just came flowing through that system. So there's one way we're connected with Christ, but there's another way. There's this there's this living way, there's this vital way, this mystical union, us and Christ. John 15, Jesus would say, I am the vine, you are the branches. I, I love it, because we can go up to a tree and go, well, the branch is right here, and we, we saw that branch off, it's a bad one. I'm gonna get rid of that branch. Can you really tell where the branch stops and where the tree begins, or the tree stops and the branch? No, 
because, you know, where does your hand and your wrist, where's the actual line? Where are the cells? You, you can't tell, right? Because the same life that's in the arm is in the hand. The same sap that runs through the base of the tree runs into the branches of the tree. There is this mystical union. We are one. <laughs> So there's these two connections we have. And of course, there's mystery involved in that, right? I don't feel it. I, I don't really understand it. How do I get my brain around that? Well, you don't have to understand it for it to be real, right? I don't understand God, yet I know he's real. He's proven himself to me, but you know, there's some issues there. I, I don't understand God the Son taking on a human flesh and coming down here and dwelling among us and then us sharing his humanity with him as the result of his work that he did on the cross. We share in his res, re, re, reward. His benefits are now our benefits. Yeah, it's mystery. I don't get it. But can you now understand what a miracle you are? What an absolute miracle that you're seated here in Christ this morning. You're His. We were dead. We were controlled. We were under the course of this world, you know, we were just picking off the menu of this world. We were doing all of these stupid things, lusts and desires, and we're by nature children of wrath, but now, but God. Something has happened. What has happened? Oh, the cross has happened. The incarnation has happened. And Christ has taken our sin upon himself and paid it in full. Hmm. There was a punishment involved and he took that punishment. God had poured out all of his holy wrath on his only begotten son. So what has happened? The cross has happened. And it's only because of the cross, only through Christ Jesus our Lord, becoming the Lamb of God that offering, taking away the sin of the world. And that allows us to be quickened. That allows us this new life with Christ, made alive together with Christ, raised up together with Christ seated now together with Christ. I know it's mystery. I, I know there's some things there, your brain's going, wait a minute, hold on. Yeah, get used to that. We're talking about God's stuff, not our stuff. What happens to him happens to us. Quickened or made alive literally means to come to the end of death. <laughs> I like that. You've come to the end of your death. You were dead spiritually. There was no divine spark in you at all. Just as our Lord, crucified on that day, died, they wrapped him up, they laid him in that tomb, they rolled the stone, and there was no spark of life in that dead corpse. None. So we have all died. We have died to the law. We have died to God's wrath. We are in a whole different realm now. We're in a whole different place. You know, in Romans chapter 8, it says, There is now therefore 
no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Wait a minute, we were dead. We were under the wrath of God. We, we were in that place. Now there is none of that. We have been taken out of that place. We're in a whole different realm now. The Christian doesn't hope for that. The Christian celebrates that. The Christian is like, whoo, that is me. Not because of anything I've done, but my Lord Jesus drug me out of that place and brought me to here. God has placed a new spirit of life in me. I don't hope for new life. I have new life. The law of the spirit of life is the opposite of being dead. <laughs> I've become the opposite of what I used to be. We're now subject to a very different spirit. You know, that spirit who used to be over the world and controlling, and we're, we're now not under that spirit anymore. We're under a different spirit. Ephesians 2.2, 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That's not us anymore. We're not under that anymore. This life, this quickening, this regeneration that we've gone through, this being born again is an act of God. People ask me sometimes, well, how do you be born again? I don't have a clue. I, you got to ask God about that. This new principle of life has been put into us. And the governing disposition of our soul is made holy. Oh, it used to be anything but that. But suddenly there's a new disposition given to us. There's a new bent in our life. I used to be twisted. Twisted all out of shape and going all the wrong directions. And now I have a new bent. I have a new lean. I want to go this way. I have a desire to go that way. And it's concerned with God and with his holiness and with his righteousness. Oh, not perfectly. Because I'm still packing around this bag of bones. This old man. But we now long to please God. Have you ever noticed that? Where'd that come from? And notice, we're not given like a new brain. Suddenly you're going to think differently. Nope. We're, we're not given a new personality. Nope. Same old idiot, you know. No, we're given a new bent. A new disposition. And it doesn't happen over time. It happens immediately. Suddenly I'm open to the things of God. I remember being up on a hill. And something happened to me up on that hill and I came off that hill immediately and wanted to read the Bible. I had never wanted to read the Bible ever in my whole life. Suddenly I want to. Suddenly I want to go to church. Suddenly I want to go to prayer meetings, you know, and, and Bible studies and Wednesday nights and Tuesday nights and all of these things. It happened in a moment. I used to be dead. I used to just be floating downstream in, in this river called life. And suddenly I awaken and I'm, I'm moving upstream under, under some power. I, I'm, you know, any dead fish can float downstream. Jesus describes this when he's talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He says... Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. For the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. This new life <laughs> is a mystery. There's some secret stuff about it. We can't fully explain it. Have you noticed that? Somebody asked, what do you mean? I'm like, I, don't, I don't know, you know? All we know is, man, once I was blind, but now I see. Once I was dead to these spiritual things, and now I'm alive to them. I want more of them. I still have the same eyes. They just see things differently. 
I still have the same brain. They just, it just understands things that it never understood before. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Notice that? Once and forever, have become new. Has our world changed? Has our circumstances changed? Has our, our job changed? Our life changed? Did anything changed? No, you have changed in the midst of all of that. And it's all according to the greatness, the exceeding greatness of his power that is working in a Christian. Do you know that this has happened to you? There's my question of the day. Are you sitting here going, yeah, something like that has happened to me. Maybe not perfectly, but I understand what this guy's talking about. I, I sense a difference. I, I feel connected. I, I'm driven to know more about God. I'm driven somehow to do this. Do you, do you realize you're different than all of your old friends? <laughs> Isn't it funny? I got saved and suddenly I didn't have any friends. It's because they didn't want to hang around with that guy. They wanted the old drunk guy, you know, the life of the party guy, the, the idiot. And I'm still the same idiot. I'm just not the life of the party guy. I'm going the other direction now, you know. Think about a newborn babe. Here's this brand new baby. Can it explain to you life? No, but every move it makes, it explains life. There is life in that little creature, right? Everything about it, the expressions, the way it moves, the way it cries, everything about it proclaims life. That is a Christian. Do we know how it happened? Nope, it's like the wind blowing through. We don't know where it came from. We just see the results. Man, this guy's swaying this way and this guy's moving that way. Some want to make Christianity all about your morality. All about what you believe, if you will. I get asked questions all the time. Yeah, but this, and about the Sabbath, and about this, and about that. and You know, you can be moral and not be a Christian. And you can be a Christian and not be moral, sadly. It's not right, but it is. Morality isn't Christianity. Christianity starts with God doing something in your life. <laughs> and then we, we grow and we learn and then our actions begin to change. Then our activity changes, behavior changes, not the other way around. Do not let the cults tell you well, you got to dress up and you got to act right and you got to start giving and attending and you got to start doing all of this stuff. Then God will love you. That's a lie. I'm sorry. So, what are you saying, Mark? I'm saying, get saved. I'm saying, get new life. Satan being born again. Because when you're born again, that's the overriding thing in your life and all these other little things morality and you're drinking and you're smoking and you're chewing and you're hanging out with girls who chew and you know all of that, that that'll that'll come along you know we have been ma made alive together with Christ we now have new insights into his word we've been given it an understanding, an unction from the Holy Spirit. We have a new disposition. We're kind of we're kind of twisted His way now, and from that flows Christian behavior. Not, not the other way around. It's not works. Somebody puts a list of works in front of you. Run, run away from that. It's God's grace, and it's only through His grace. Well, how do you get that? You ask him for it. I will turn away no one who comes to me, Jesus said. 
I won't turn around away a single soul who comes to me. But I will not put up with anybody thinking they can earn their way there. Is there anything more wonderful than to just stand back as a Christian and realize what God has done to the person in your seat? How he has changed you and transformed you and tweaked you and pulled you and brought you. Once so lost, once so dead to spiritual things, so blinded, so separated from God, but now we've been brought near by the blood of Christ. We have been saved from God's wrath. Because now we are in Christ Jesus. And all of his wrath has already been poured out on Christ Jesus. We're given this new life. Much of us fail right here. Many Christians fail in these two areas. One is we don't realize just how lost we were. Just how hopeless and desperate and full of sin and evil that we were. We were dead in that. And then we fell here. We fell to realize everything that God has done to bring us to where we are. It's a glorious difference. The apostle goes on to say in verse 6, and raised us up together with Christ. When our Lord was raised from the dead, from that tomb, certain things were no longer true of him that were once true of him. And the same is true of a Christian. Once you have been raised to new life, certain things about your past life are no longer true about you. The first truth is the Christian is no longer spiritually dead. <laughs> we were. I remember those days. I was. I was running from God. I didn't want anything to do with him. I, I didn't want to read his word. I didn't want to obey his commandments. I didn't want to do any of that stuff. I was absolutely dead to those spiritual things. We were all in that spiritual grave. But now we have been raised and now we come out of that grave, we're no longer in that realm. We're in a totally different realm. We belong, you know, to an entirely new place. To become a Christian is the most profound thing that will ever happen to a human being, ever, in the history of man. It's the most profound thing it's nothing short of being dead and coming to life it's nothing short of being in the grave and now walking in liberty the very fact that we are no longer spiritually dead is proof that we are no longer under the wrath of God Romans 4.25 says, who was delivered, talking about Christ, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. The apostle says, our Lord's death was on account of our offenses, not his, ours. And he died paying for those sins and those transgressions. But how do we know that God was satisfied with that? How do we know that it's, it's going to be okay with us how do we know? The resurrection. Life. When Christ appeared after his death, he was giving us absolute proof that God was satisfied with his offering. Absolute proof. Next time you read through the Gospels, after the resurrection, and Jesus is they're speaking to those people. When he appears to the 500 brethren at once, when he appears to Peter and James and John, when he appears to those guys, what's he saying? 
What's he saying? God was satisfied. You can now, you sinners can now be saved. You ungodly are now welcome. Your and my sins have been paid in full. To Telestai, right? What's the next verse say? Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, notice the terms, having been once and for all justified. How? By faith in Christ Jesus. By faith. We have peace with God now through our Lord Jesus Christ. We were raised together with Christ. Therefore, we are now justified just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. That's how God looks at you now. And justification isn't a process. Justification is the king sitting on his throne, banging the gavel down and saying, that one is without sin. That one, I will never see sin in them again. Imagine that proclamation coming from the king, the creator, God Almighty. That's why there is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Because we're now raised with Christ. We, are, we were by nature children of wrath, but now we are by spirit. No longer there. We're risen. We're seated. We've been justified. We shouldn't just know these truths. We should be glorying in them. We should just be sitting there just, whoo, thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. I mean, it amazes me. Doesn't it amaze you that he would have chose you? <laughs> don't you know people that are better than you? And you're going, why didn't you? I don't understand. That guy's so much better than me. Every day, every, every moment. I'm like, I don't understand why me. I totally get you can do that, God. And I think it's amazing, but I don't understand why you drug me along. Because I'm the least deserving of any. How did it happen? It's all because of our union in Christ, with Christ, together with him. So what happens to us has happened to him. What happened to him happens to us. We were crucified. We were buried. We were given new life and rose again. We're joined to him. As he rose from that place of the grave, from that place of death and of punishment, so have we. We've risen from it. We're no longer in that realm. There's no more place for punishment. It's all been punished. That, that takes away fear. It takes away that fear. But Paul goes on to say in, in Romans chapter 7, verse 1, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For if the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives, but if the husband dies, she is released from that law of her husband. So then... If while her husband lives, she marries another man, she's an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And she is no adulteress, so, though she has married another man. Therefore, brethren, you also have become dead to the law. Did you read that? In the same way, because of the same activity that God is doing in you, you become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. He says, because Christ died, we are now raised to new life in Christ, that we are now dead to the law. We were born into this world, and in this world, we come face to face with God's law. It's staring at us constantly. You ever notice that? Your old life? <laughs> You'd steal that Snickers bar, and there's that law. 
Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not have no other gods. So, you know, and here it is. And it was constantly facing us and challenging us and condemning us because we could never keep it. But now in Christ, God deals with us by grace, not by law. What this doesn't mean is that there is no, nor, uh, no longer a moral standard. Of course there is a moral standard. The law is perfect and just and righteous. We just do not find our access to God through keeping the law. We find our access to God through Christ Jesus and his work for us. Our relationship is not governed by law. Our relationship is governed by the fact that God has called us his children. <laughs> we have a personal relationship now, not a legal one. People constantly throwing legal stuff at me. Yeah, but you don't do this and you don't do that. That, that affects not anything in my relationship with my father. Nothing. Because I have a relationship with my father. That's the thing they don't have. So they have to have the law. All the demands of the law have been met in Christ Jesus, my Lord. And when I am in him, all of the demands of the law have been met. Even further, the apostle says, we are now in Christ and we are dead to sin. Interesting how he says it in Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin? Did you catch that? How shall we who have died to sin or dead to sin live in it any longer? Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Have you died with Christ? Were you crucified with Christ? Then you're dead to sin. What does that mean? Does that mean I'll never sin again? No, doesn't mean that at all. <laughs> you know, John says that in 1 John 1, 8, you know, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. You're a liar. You know, you need to get back on the train here, you know. So what does it really mean? It means that we used to be slaves of sin. We were under the control of the evil one, being directed by various lusts and desires. But now we have been removed from that realm. Sin no longer has power over you. Oh, we can be stupid and put ourselves back under that with a desire or a lust or some stupid thing. But it no longer owns us. It no longer controls us. And when we fail now, what do we find ourselves doing? Oh God, oh God, oh God. I'm sorry. I, oh Lord, forgive me. Where'd that come from? That, that isn't how you used to sin. You used to be, don't let God see me. I'm over here, get away from me, God. And now you're running to him in the middle of sin. And we are being constantly cleansed by his blood. We have died with Christ. We are risen with Christ. And we no longer belong to that realm of the law, that realm of death, that realm of sin. We no longer belong there. <laughs> what a glorious truth, isn't it? How often we're walking through life and we actually now think temptation is sin. You ever notice that? These thoughts have come into your mind. You're like, oh, oh, get that out of there. Oh, Lord, forgive me. That wasn't sin. You're not in control of thoughts that just meander. In you. Most of the time, those thoughts aren't your thoughts. The enemy's trying to put some thoughts. The enemy's putting some pictures in front of your eyes. The enemy's doing these things. But there's still some pollution in this old body. I don't know if you've noticed that. And it carries along some pollution, some corruption with it. And every once in a while, that'll rise up. And yeah, is there battles? Absolutely, there are battles. 
Do I need to worry about them constantly? No. I turn them over to God and I walk on because guess what? I have been once and forever justified. I have been given new life once and forever. I have been in Christ Jesus. I, I love the illustration. Here's me. I am now in Christ Jesus. Whatever happens to Christ happens to me. Wherever he goes, I go. Can anything get to me? Not unless it comes through him. I love the illustration. We are in Christ Jesus. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Your old man. I love the way that is. That doesn't mean your husband, ladies. It's that one that was born in Adam. So that descendant of Adam, are you one of those? I can guarantee you are, right? It's the one with the fallen nature. And because Adam sinned, we all sin. We all, we all get that. It's in our blood. It's, it's come down. We're the descendants of him. And consequently, we're all under the wrath of God. That is the old man. But now in Christ. When Christ died, so did that old man. So did your old man. My connection with Adam was severed in that death. I'm no longer a son of Adam. Physically, still am. Oh, but spiritually, mm -mm, no part of me. I am now in a hu new humanity. I am in Christ Jesus. God no longer looks at me as a descendant of Adam, but he looks at me through his only begotten son. I'm now in his bloodline. I'm now in his control. I'm a new man. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things have become new, right? Not will become new. Not are becoming new. Have become new. So what Paul's saying is he's saying, I'm no longer have this Adamic nature, this nature I got from Adam. I'm no longer under God's wrath. I'm no longer under the law. I'm no longer under the dominion of sin, no longer under the dominion of Satan. I am now in God's eyes a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. Jesus, his only begotten son. That old man has passed away. That describes a Christian. You want to define a Christian? Define him that way. Not the way we sometimes do. Well, that guy's a pretty good Christian because he reads the Bible once in a while and he prays. I've heard him. And, and he, you know, we, we get all of these definitions of what a Christian might be. Sorry, this is a definition of a Christian. And we are nothing less than this. It's not my membership, it's not my attendance, it's not my giving, it's not the way I dress, it's not my morality, it's no other worldly measure at all. The Christian is the one who is in Christ. That's the Christian. And now we share the life of Christ. He is the vine, I am the branch, the same sap, the same lifeblood. We are fundamentally different than we used to be. I was once dead to God, but now I am alive to him. We're in tune with eternal things, spiritual things. We've been awakened to realities, you know. I have this entirely new attitude towards God. I used to think he was that big bully waiting around the corner for me to blow it so he could just thump me. It was whack-a-mole, except it was whack-a-mark, you know? And every time my head would pop up, he'd just, you know, thump me. I'm no longer at war with God. Now I'm on his side. That is a change from death to life. All of our nature now cries out for him. 
Have you noticed that? Have you experienced that? You just have times where it's like, oh, God, I need you to move here. Oh, God, I need your strength here. Oh, God, Father, come, bless, come, touch. It's like you have an electric light. You have a lamp in your house, and it's plugged in. But you've never flicked it on. And the whole purpose of that lamp is to have that little twisty knob go click and shines, you know? That's what's happened to us. We were just lamps that were plugged in, but no power was flowing through them. And suddenly, someone reached down and flipped your switch. And suddenly, there's light, and there's life, and there's power. <laughs> This amazing transformation, this amazing black and white comparison that Paul does in these first seven verses. The Christian now walking in newness of life. Our lives are now being transformed. Our, our minds are being, you know, renewed, transformed by the renewing of our minds. We see and understand things in life differently than most other people do because we see things differently. We know that life is just temporary. Whatever's going on with this carcass we're, we're packing around, it's just temporary, right? We all know one of these days we're gonna put this tent off. We're gonna put this carcass down. And some of us, you know, it's happening faster than we want it to. I, I totally get that, you know? I'm okay with doing it. I'm just not excited about how it might happen. Piece by piece and part by part or, you know. I don't know. But right now, we seek Him. We seek His praise and His glory and His honor. And we long to bring worship and praise to God our Father and to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've become interested in the Bible of all things, right? I mean, I even had to learn to read again so I could read the Bible, so I could understand the Bible, so I could read to you guys the Bible. You know, it's weird how that worked. You know? I want to learn about these spiritual things. I want to come and have fellowship with you guys. I love you guys. I love hanging out with you guys. Man, my desires have totally changed. I think back, you know, 30 years ago, and I had some desires. I had some wants. Lots of cars. You know, little house, big shop. You know. Now I think about treasures in heaven. I think about spiritual rewards. I think about the future. I hunger and thirst for righteousness. Have you ever done that? Just, oh God, I, I feel so bankrupt over here. I feel like I've got nothing. Just prayer. Just the idea that you pray. <laughs> Isn't that weird? I used to pray these Christmas lists. Anybody ever pray those? Oh God, bless Jerry and Billy and Jim and, you know, and bless me and bring me, you know. And you'd pray your Christmas list. I don't pray that way anymore. No Christmas list involved. It's revealing my desire to be with him, to spend time with him, be directed by him. How wonderfully different is the Christian than the guy who walks around on this planet dead? Oh, do you know God in this way? Has your old man been crucified together with him? Have you been raised together with him in life? Do you desire him? To know him? To understand him? To hang out with him? Do you seek him? Do you have these proofs of life in you? Oh, I pray that you do. Because that is Christianity. Right? 
Father, Lord, thank you for using the Apostle Paul to just describe these things to us. Put it in black and white, Lord, that we might see with clarity who we were and now who we are. And God, we praise you for the change. We praise you that you have chosen to give us new life. Bring us to yourself. Draw us into your kingdom. God, that you have taken us out of the kingdom of darkness and placed us into the kingdom of the Son of your love. Ah, it's glorious, Lord. God, would you walk with us this week? Encourage us, draw us to yourself. Lord, help us to love those around us. Help us to see them as people who are dead, people who are blind, people who need you so that they can truly see what this life is all about. Oh, Lord God, come, Lord, walk among us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.